Um, so we have three researchers here who have actually used registries in their research, and so we're going to ask them to talk for about 10 minutes about, um, about how the, what their experience has been and sort of the benefits of using registries. Um, just to introduce them, this is Dr. Philip Binkley. He's a professor in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine and a director of cardiovascular research for the division. His research focuses on congestive heart failure and the clinical and genetic predictors of LV systolic function recovery. He's nationally recognized as an outstanding clinician and clinical researcher, and he'll be discussing his experience with registries in cardiology today. Next is Dr. Jennifer Bogner. She's an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation here at Ohio State. She's vice chair of research and academic affairs for the department and is a board certified rehabilitation psychologist. She's nationally known for her research on the long-term outcomes of traumatic brain injury. She will be discussing the Ohio Regional Traumatic Brain Injury Model Systems. And finally, we have Dr. Patrick Ross. He's a professor of clinical surgery and the chief of the Division of Thoracic Surgery here at Ohio State. He's nationally recognized as an outstanding thoracic surgeon with an interest in thoracic surgical oncology and minimally invasive surgery. His research focuses on new modalities in lung cancer research. He's going to be talking today about the robotic assisted thoracic surgery registry and the photodynamic therapy for lung and esophageal cancer registry. So we'll get started with Dr. Binkley. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. So I thought I'd talk about a couple of different aspects of registries and maybe one that is a little different than, than you may have heard of, uh, of its use, and that is uh, in the, uh, the vein of doing uh, predictive modeling and prediction in outcomes in patients with a variety of diseases. So to give you a little background, uh, we have noticed over the years that uh, people with severe reductions in heart function have gradually uh, improved their uh, heart function in many cases back to a normal level. So we uh, created a logistic regression model uh, a few years ago uh, not through a registry, but through gradually building uh, obs observations prospectively in our clinic and published uh, a model that can show associations between recovery of heart function and, uh, and various five different clinical variables that stuck out. Now, so the, those of you who have done any modeling may be aware of that as a so-called training set. We can show associations, but if we want to use it in a predictive way, we have to validate it. Now, one way to validate uh, a model like that is to start from ground zero and start tracking uh, patients as we go forward uh, in uh, our clinic again. But another valid way to do that is to have some kind of registry data, which we have in our heart failure uh, uh, setting, both through a database called uh, uh, CHF Manager, and also currently Dr. Ramesh Amani in our division and Albert Lai are working on a program to try to get data uh, out of EPIC specifically about our heart failure patients. So, so another way you can validate a model rather than spending all the time doing uh, a prospective measure is to select patients from a registry that, that we are setting up and, uh, and being able to, to track people through that registry that have recovered heart function, those that have not. And then you can apply your model to that set and again validate it and determine how well it functions. So, uh, so this is kind of, I think, maybe an idea, a way to use registries you may not have thought of before, but it is a, a very valid and useful clinical tool that we can then perhaps, you know, our desire is if we validate that model, somebody who comes into our clinic, we can tell them, uh, you know, what is the likelihood that you're going to respond very well to medical therapy. And the other implication is if the probability is low that somebody's going to recover well, they may be considered a candidate for uh, more aggressive therapies such as biventricular pacing, which leads us to another registry that we have in cardiology, which is our uh, electrophysiology and um, uh, uh, device clinic uh, registry, and this also uh, is, pertains to this model. One of our questions was if you do have a low probability of recovering 
left ventricular function with medical therapy alone? Can you uh, respond to other therapies such as biventricular pacing? So through this registry, we were able to get over 400 patients who had had so-called biventricular pacers put in place. We could take their data and put them into their, our model and stratify them into their probability of recovering normal heart function. And, um, and actually showed that indeed, if you had a low probability of recovering heart function with medical therapy, you could still respond to uh, biventricular pacing and, and actually recover normal heart function. Again, something that without uh, this kind of registry data would have taken us quite a long period of time to prospectively accumulate the data and ha having the data right there allowed us to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll mention just a couple of other things um, we uh, uh, have used, and I know you'll hear a lot more about the in data information warehouse, but we use the data information warehouse for our own very specific interest in a group of uh, of investigators that were interested in the impact of depression on cardiovascular disease and the associates of depression and cardiovascular disease. So we implemented depression screening in the Ross Heart Hospital, and we considered trying to set up our own database and, and those kinds of things, which would have been very complicated. Instead, we were able to transmit our, our results of the depression screening to the information warehouse and then extract those data as well as many, many other clinical variables that would have been difficult for us to accumulate uh, ourselves and have over 2,000 patients now we're looking at and analyzing meaningful uh, associations between cardiovascular disease and depression. So if you will, we've sort of uh, used uh, and modified in a way the information warehouse as, our, as a big registry but with our own data added rather than trying to create our own uh, specific database. The, the last couple of things, thing I'll mention, if you have interest, one of our former members of uh, uh, the uh, bioinformatics program here, uh, Yosef Khan, had an interesting background in both epidemiology and informatics. He's now with the National American Heart Association, and they are uh, making available large data sets uh, for exploring different cardiovascular disease questions based on the many large studies the American Heart Association has done. And if you, um, you know, get in touch with me, I can forward you information about that. I haven't heard about cost yet. I, I have heard that, uh, and hopefully there's no cost. Interestingly, my professional college, the American College of Cardiology, I found will indeed let you propose to extract data uh, from some of their registries. My division director asked about that, and they only wanted $100,000 to do it. So not all, not all of the professional registries are that accessible. We're hoping the American Hearts is, is much more so. So I'll leave that at, at my comments, and thank Great. you. Great. Thanks. Dr. Bogner. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Traumatic Brain Injury Model Systems national data set, as well as the one, the one that we have here at Ohio, the Ohio Regional Traumatic Brain Injury Model Systems data set. I don't typically, and I haven't typically thought about it as a registry, though it does use registry information. Um, but I'm also finding that people have different definitions of registry. So let me tell you a little bit about what, we, what we're doing. The Traumatic Brain Injury National Database has been in existence since 1988. It was, it's been funded through the National Institute of Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Um, and we at Ohio State have been continuously funded to contribute to that data set since 1997. The full data set um, currently consists of 16 different sites uh, distributed nationally. Over 13,000 participants are in that data set and it is the largest longitudinal data set on traumatic brain injury in the world. We collect data from our, the acute care. Uh, we also collect data on that person's premorbid men mental and physical health and background information. We collect data from the rehabilitation stay, and then we follow them um, for years after their injury for as long as we possibly can. 
So we we follow them at one year, two year, five year, and every five years thereafter. And at this point, some of the sites are collecting 25 year data. We're up to 15 here at Ohio State. Um, the what we do, the, me the mechanisms of, of collecting this data basically means that we enroll people after they've sustained a traumatic brain injury and they're receiving rehabilitation. And um, for someone to receive rehabilitation, inpatient rehabilitation, they had to have sustained a moderate or severe traumatic brain injury. So, so these are people who are significantly impaired. Um, they're, not, they're not typically people that would be um, considered to have had a concussion. So, for example, your sports-related concussion, that's not, those are not the people included in this data set. It's people with more severe injuries. So we enroll them. We obtain informed consent while they're, while they're receiving rehabilitation. And um, then after enrollment, we collect data from some existing registries. So for example, our participating hospitals that feed into our rehabilitation site, including Ohio State, but also Grant and Riverside and Mount Carmel, all of them keep a trauma registry that they contribute to um, the Ohio uh, Trauma Board for following um, trauma uh, victims through, throughout. And we collect data from that registry that um, tells us about their trauma care. So we ext extract that data. But then we go back to the medical records and we collect more data from acute care and from the rehabilitation stay. We interview them. And then, as I said, we also do telephone interviews with them for years following that. And that's what our data set looks like. Um, so it, it's comprised of medical record data, it's comprised of trauma registry <coughs> data, and it's comprised of uh, interview data as well. We also have partnerships with other uh, national organizations, with, with the VA, with a CDC, and with NIH, so that we can go beyond our data set, our national data set, and um, do comparisons with other data sets as well. So we're, we have a partnership with the VA, with the polytrauma centers. They're collecting data on, on their veterans and um, their service members, and we're able to compare that data. We're able to compare our data to CDC's um, data sets so that we can see how comparable our data set is to the national sample, so we know whether or not we're representative of the national sample. So we're doing things like that. We're also able to connect with, uh, we're, we're just in the process actually of connecting with another national um, uh, initiative which is going to be connecting, all, linking all of the different data sets on traumatic brain injury through a common um, identifier so that our nation, our, the data that we've collected can be linked with say other intervention studies that have been conducted through NIH and if the same person has, has um, participated in our studies and also participated in those other studies, then those data sets can actually be linked through an identifier that, w that is not, cannot go back to the person in terms of actually identifying exactly who that person is, but actually links all of their data that's been collected about them. So it doesn't actually personally identify them. Um, it keeps them, uh, them safe and their privacy safe but all of their data is actually linked. So we've got all of those initiatives going. So what have we found out from all this data? Um, we have found out um, more about mor mortality risk uh, following traumatic brain injury. So after you've sustained a significant traumatic brain injury, you're, you've got an increase in mortality risk of, of, of two times um, other individuals of comparable age after you've already lived through rehabilitation. You have uh, nine years uh, less life expectancy than, than the average person without a traumatic brain injury. We know that you start to get better after a severe traumatic brain injury, and during your first year, you um, show a reduction in disability, a rapid reduction in disability. Um, after two years, it starts to level off. But then after five years, about 40% of folks start, start to show a decline in their functioning. And um, what we've begun to study is we've begun to study traumatic brain injury not as something that's just occurred this one time, but as something that's a chronic uh, medical condition <coughs> that will increase risk for other medical conditions later on in life. So we've, we've begun to understand traumatic brain injury along the continuum. We've also begun to understand traumatic brain injury, again, not only as something that happens just once, but most likely if you've sustained one, you've sustained others. And we've looked at uh, what the impact is of, of having multiple traumatic brain injuries on your outcomes. 
We've also identified other risk factors for um, less than optimal outcomes following traumatic brain injury, such, such as substance misuse. And that has spurred studies here at Ohio State on how to intervene to reduce substance misuse following traumatic brain injury. We know one of the leading causes of death is alcohol poisoning following traumatic brain injury after you've, after you've left rehabilitation. So we need to reduce substance misuse. We've also developed outcome measures. Um, we have done more pragmatic research, like test retest reliability and identifying minimally clinically important differences that can be used in intervention studies. So uh, I could go on and on about the kinds of studies that have come out of this database. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of participants, and so we owe it to them to be publishing and identifying not only risk factors, but better interventions to improve optimal outcomes following traumatic brain injury. I'll stop there. Great. Well, first of all, I appreciate the chance to, uh, to be here with you this morning. <clears throat> and as the token surgical representative to the team, I'll talk about a few things. This is the usual ratio of internists to surgeons, by the way. <laughs> and we like it that way. So uh, we, use, uh, we use databases or registries in a couple of different ways. And I want to talk about um, briefly about a national database that we use for thoracic surgery through the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Um, and, and then talk about two local registries that have been helpful to us in stimulating uh, outcomes research and collaboration with other uh, centers. So the STS database, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons database, has started out as an, a plan to, uh, to evaluate cardiac and thoracic surgical procedures in terms of length of stay, uh, in terms of uh, morbidity, mortality, uh, sort of the generic outcomes measures that you would be interested in following a surgical procedure. The real value in that is that centers who contribute contribute a lot of data, and that then becomes an excellent source against which you can benchmark as you look at your own local data. So the STS database is sort of in the background of everything that we do. About three and a half years ago, uh, we were at a point of beginning a robotic thoracic surgery program. And we have now, in three and a half years, we just passed our 500th procedure, which is, uh, which is great. And what we started off by saying is, okay, we are now taking a very high-tech procedure. So the robot uh, costs $2.1 million as a, as a cash outlay, increased costs of disposable. So it's not only an expensive resource, but it's a limited resource. Eight surgical specialties at Ohio State use the procedure. And we do over 2,000 robotic procedures across those eight surgical specialties every year. And thoracic surgery was the last one into the foray, okay? So now we're taking a routine procedure that we've done either open or with thoracoscopic instruments, and we're, we're buying a new tool, and the tool costs $2.1 million, and seven other surgical teams want to use it during the same time that you do, which is 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. So in order to evaluate whether or not we are using it in the right way, we really have to have data. How do we go to, uh, go to Steve Gabby and say, well, we need another $2 million for another robot to do thoracic surgery when we don't know whether there's any value in doing thoracic surgery with robotics, right? So there's no data out there. So from the very beginning, we, uh, we developed uh, our plan for a registry where every, from case number one, every patient was enrolled into an IRB registry. And as soon as when we finally, this year, are beginning to be able to, uh, to mine the data, and we were able to compare 240 robotically performed procedures against our 240 traditional open procedures, and look at some outcomes metrics. So we looked at four things, and what we found was that length of stay was down by two days, that, um, which is great for hospital throughput efficiency and is a good cost-effectiveness model because if the patient gets out quicker, then we get a new patient into that bed, so there's an economic value. We found that the readmission rate was decreased, and again, uh, goes to throughput as well as patient satisfaction. And there was only a single readmission for pain control compared to the open procedure where the incidence was significantly higher. 
we found that there was a lower complication rate with respect to post-operative pneumonia. So there's a, there's a patient outcome variable that's very important. And um, what we found is that, um, that there was improved nodal staging of these patients so that you're technically or theoretically doing a better oncologic operation. So if you have patients who get more appropriately staged, who have a smoother recovery, who are in the hospital less time with quicker return to the normal lifestyle, you might theorize that they'll have a better long-term oncologic outcome, better able to tolerate adjuvant therapy. So um, that's the five-year plan. So this is, you know, we're, not, we're not at a point where we can harvest that data, but ultimately we're gonna be able to look not only at the short-term variables of the economics uh, of how this is done, but we're also going to be able to look long-term and evaluate what the true oncologic benefit of changing how we conduct the operation has imp impacted the patient. So that's one way we do it. The second registry is, uh, is really homegrown, and Priyal Shah is my, uh, my uh, coordinator for this registry, and I appreciate her being here, and she might answer some questions for you as well. So there is a technique called photodynamic therapy. You may have heard of it, you may not. It's, uh, if there is a niche procedure, it truly is it. And it was, uh, it's been around since 1975, um, but there is very little, until recently, basic science data to evaluate it. Uh, there is very little in way of, of uh, randomized trials to evaluate it. And what it is, is an ablative technology to treat lung cancer or esophageal cancer within the lumen. So through a bronchoscope or an esophagoscope. It's an endoluminal technique. Been around for 40 years uh, with very little supporting data, no randomized trials. So um, we got involved with it back in 1998 when it first became FDA approved. And if you look at what a, a busy center, and we're a busy center, we, we do maybe 40 or 50 of those procedures in the course of a year. But if you look at the 40 centers who use the technique, they each do somewhere between three and 10. Uh, so a busy center might do 25, and there's one of those, we did 50. So how do you ever how do you ever stratify that, that data when on your personal level you're only doing five in a year? And if you think about it, uh, you might do five and two of them are esophageal and one of those was an adeno and one was a squame and three of them are lung and one was a small cell and one was an adeno, one was a squame and, and one of them was a stage 3A and one of them was a stage 2. So, so you understand the complexities of trying to make any sense out of whether the technique is valuable. So Ohio State uh, got a group together that was interested, and we started off, as most of these projects do, with uh, uh, the first meeting was uh, very well attended. I was 100% attendance. I was there. And, uh, and then the second meeting had, uh, had three of us, and then the next meeting had five. And we're now three years into it, and with Priol's outstanding help supporting me, we now have 10 centers uh, and very reputable centers, Duke, Emory, University of Alabama, Cedar sinai Pittsburgh, Allegheny, some very, uh, very credible centers have signed on with us. University of Chicago just joined the team. So now we have 10 centers contributing data, and as opposed to how we started this process with the onesies and twosies being done at each center, limiting institutional ability to move it forward, we now have a thousand patients in the registry by going back and doing a retrospective component and getting everyone's old data for the last 10 years and then adding the new data over the over these three years so we have a retrospective component and we have a prospective component and this year with that volume of patients we're now first able to stratify by cell type by stage by age of the patient by uh, what other combined therapies they may have had with radiation and chemotherapy. And uh, we've just started to send out some abstracts as, uh, as part of our research team under the authorship of everyone who contributed. And it's a way that will probably take this technology, which was sort of dying on the vine, and uh, finally, for the first time, even though it's been around for 40 years, be able to prospectively an analyze the impact that it has on lung cancer and esophageal cancer. That's what we did. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. That was very interesting.
I'm going to just open up the floor to questions. Does anyone have anything they want to ask anyone? Hi, my name is Megan Ballinger, and I'm actually a basic science researcher. I'm a PhD, and I'm starting, I'm trying to get a registry started. And I'm, I'm definitely more interested in the genomic aspects of it, but I realize that we've got to be able to correlate the clinical stuff. And so I'm wondering, how do I even get access to some of these? I am a PI of, of an IRB, um, but I have no access to any of the clinical samples because I don't have access to EPIC or IHIS or any of that stuff. So can you give me any like basic principles of how to even go about starting these registries and partnerships well, and that kind of stuff? I mean, I'm going to jump in and then Phil will mm -hmm. run with it. So, so my first answer is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Uh, there, are, there are clinical faculty uh, populating this institution who are dying for opportunities to collaborate with you uh, to use your resources and share what they have to facilitate their own career development, promotion, and uh, career advancement. So I would just uh, really also uh, second and third what Pat said. I think that's where there's a lot of ground for interaction that we're not taking enough advantage of at this institution. And just like I think we're hoping we can expand and unify uh, registries of different kinds. We're trying to also expand and unify a variety of biorepositories as well. I was on a uh, task force from uh, the university last year where we're trying to avoid having people, as some people say, have lots of little chunks of tissue and samples and freezers and unify those. So I think as we go forward, that will help. So collaboration is important. I think, you know, you'll find that uh, we have uh, a biorepository in the Heart and Lung Research Institute that is um, largely tissue, though we can derive, but we have clinical data on those uh, subjects. There also is a similar repository in uh, for people with uh, electrophysiologic abnormalities uh, that's run through Amy Sturm in uh, genetics and also a large cancer uh, genetic registry it, with both genetic data and outcomes data. But uh, as you see the problem, I just had to list three different sources for you and I think all those people are eager to, uh, to collaborate, but it's kind of learning the, the landscape. But I, I think what you're saying is, is phenomenally important. You know, Vanderbilt uh, started a large program a few years ago that was an opt-out program. In other words, they somehow decided they could collect your genetic material if you were completely de-identified. And I've spoken with the people who organized that database, and they're not very happy with it because at some point, yeah, you've got huge numbers, but at some point you, ha you can't go back and identify the patient. If you want to go back, you can say, yeah, here are all these uh, genes associated with atrial fibrillation, but if you want to know more about the people, you can't get that. So. We're hoping, just like the registries, I hope we can grow. We're hoping we can get those biorepositories unified also. And I, I just want to make one more point along those lines is that with the newer areas of research where we haven't done as much in that area, definitely get together with, with folks, again, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Traumatic brain injury is one of those areas where we're just starting getting started and actually we really are talking about adding that to our consent form right now. We don't have an expert in that area. If you're interested, let us know. <laughs> if I can ask the uh, panelists to uh, comment about how they're able to fund their registries, both the local and at the national level, and particularly at the uh, start uh, when you're getting them off the ground. Uh, if I could have uh, each of the panelists make a comment about how their registries have been funded. All right, well, I'm on this end. So uh, three ways. Uh, so the STS uh, database, which is a national registry, uh, is funded through health system resources because it is used as a data repository for uh, third party contracting. So you have to participate to participate in certain insurance contracts. So that's an expense associated with, uh, with running the health system. So that's number one. Um, on the local level, um, our, uh, uh, our PDT registry is uh, funded through uh, industry uh, grants. And that is uh, uh, 
you know, you submit, you get it, you, uh, you have a source of funding for a period of time. And so industry sponsored for that. And our robotics registry is uh, funded through philanthropy. Uh, we, have, uh, um, we have grateful patients who contribute um, uh, every year in various sums, from some from very small amounts to uh, others up to a million dollars. And these grateful patients are a wonderful source of, of research funding for, uh, for small divisions. It, it's tough getting, getting um, funding for registries in general. Um, but uh, we've gotten our funding through the National Institute of Disability and Rehabilitation Research. We started out with a pilot project, um, a longitudinal database in, in 1991 that went for five years, and that was, that was on a minimal budget, minimal budget. Um, and then that prepared us to be able to enter into the, into the, national, the model systems national data set um, competition, and, and we got that grant, and we've been continuously funded. Um, but there aren't a lot of sources out there for, for longitudinal data sets. Well, unfortunately, our smaller local registries have all been basically uh, collaborative, and we haven't really spent much of anything on them. I mean, we, uh, our, our registry of heart failure patients is something that uh, we started as a clinical enterprise in our uh, division actually uh, purchased that and as a clinical tool we can also use it as an investigative tool that's true for our registry of uh, electrophysiology uh, patients uh, in our EP uh, section fortunately uh, you know when we I mentioned we sort of used uh, uh, the uh, IW is sort of a registry by putting our own data into that and I don't it costs money, but it didn't cost us <laughs> any money really to do that. It took us more effort to actually get the uh, form approved as part of the hospital data collection than it did getting it in uh, to the IW. So I think you know there are ways, at least with smaller data collection and with expert collaborators who may be experts in bioinformatics or databasing and who want to collaborate, it is possible to do some of the smaller registries. I think uh, without funding. There are also, uh, and, and we could talk a little bit about the difference between a data registry and, and a survey database, but you know, there are a lot of nationally uh, accessible uh, databases, parts of NHANES, for instance, are publicly accessible, National Health Information uh, Survey. Uh, you have to know how to analyze those data correctly because they're survey data, not just registry data. But there also are publicly accessible databases that people can do uh, meaningful research if they know how to do it correctly. I do have an um, um, unrelated question, and that is, I'd be interested in the panelists' experiences in terms of when you originally set up the questions that you wanted to address your registry, you decided you were going to collect so much data. But then by the time you actually collect the data, you realize you forgot to collect data in one area, and that you're collecting too much data in another area, so your mm -hmm. colleagues are beginning to balk and <coughs> they don't want to put in all that uh, information. Um, how did you go through the, I'd be interested to hear some anecdotal comments about how you went through those processes. Well, I mean, I would make one, uh, this is maybe not a direct answer to your question, of course, sometimes registries are collected without any particular a priori question. They may just be collecting data that could be of use at some point. But uh, I would just, and, and again, I know you're going to hear more about the data information warehouse. You know, it's very rich. Uh, and you also may have heard or will hear that it can be an honest broker that can give you data without going through the uh, I, it, through the IRB if it's de-identified to the investigator. <clears throat> For the reasons you mentioned, I would encourage you to not do that uh, because every time I've done that, <clears throat> I wanted to get more data. I wanted to go back, as you said, and find other data, which is not hard to do through the information warehouse, but if you go back too many times, it can't really be de-identified. De so we've taken the stance that I always get an IRB to begin with. For instance, the depression study I mentioned, we went 
through the process of getting an IRB and indeed we're going through and finding other data that we need to have and we can just modify our IRB. So uh, that's not a direct answer to your question, but I think if you go the IW route, that's something you may want to consider when you do have to get additional data. When we first started out, I think we had over 400 data points that we were collecting from the medical records. And um, as we've gotten together with our national collaborators, we've reduced that down to about a quarter of that. Um, now people want to add some things back in that we took out before. So we go back and forth all the time. Um, it, is, it is coming up with a balance. I think that what we're finding is collecting the most reliable data um, data that is collected in exactly the same way across different sites is, is the most important. Um, things that are not collected in the same way are, are, are generally useless in, in a national data set. So that's what we've learned through the years is, is collect the best and most reliable data. And then we do modules. We do smaller studies where a couple of different sites might just collect certain data points that they can collect in a standardized way to use for certain studies. So the, uh, the, the problem uh, gets you on both sides, as you've alluded to, and we, uh, we have made both sets of mistakes. So initially in, our, um, in the photodynamic therapy registry, we, um, uh, because we were paying for the development of this web-based registry for other centers, we didn't want to recreate the entire medical record within it, so we picked all of the what we thought were the big targets in terms of oncologic and procedural variables that should go in. And then uh, as we had our most recent investigators meeting, we realized that, uh, that we weren't adequately assessing the long-term outcome. So we've now gone back and had to go through the IRB process of adding in um, IRB approved outcome scores. And it, uh, it means that now we have this whole this whole cohort of patients for whom we won't have that data, but then we'll have the new ones who do. So we've, we've made the mistake that way. Um, with our robotics registry, uh, because it is local, um, we again bombed the big targets and picked those outcomes we thought would be important, length of stay, chest tube duration, time of the operation, all those um, perhaps economically driven variables that we thought would relate to short-term outcomes. But as we start to go back and look at, at what are the long-term benefits, uh, it means going back to the charts. And as Phil's alluded to, you really want to minimize the number of times you go back to the charts because that, the labor-intensive part is the initial abstraction. And when you have to re-abstract, um, that's an added expense. So you have to, you have to strike a balance between um, you know, what, what, is, uh, what is economically and control uh, reasonable for you in terms of the resources you have and uh, recognizing that you may guess wrong and that down the road you may have to back it up and, and do it again. Great, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Does anyone have any lingering questions? I have one more, um, and this is more just a general question, but I think you guys were alluding to it in the last, um, answering the last question, but what are some of the major challenges you've come across in, in either creating these registries or using them for research? Well, you know, I think, so here I'll, I, I, Carson knows I also have an appointment in epidemiology. So one of the things I'll mention that, uh, you, again, you have to be cautious about is how what can you interpret from the registry when you set it up because and that's why I, you know it's important you know you mentioned comparing your registry to another registry because keep in mind this is really registries are in many ways a sample of convenience so your internal validity may be very strong but how much can you extrapolate that to other populations so i think that's a challenge once you have your registry how are you going to interpret the data and they're, they're not like, say I mentioned NHANES something which is a probability sample where you know that each sample, each person is representative of so many people of that demographic in the population. That's also why you have to have a statistical consultation or know how to 
analyze those data with certain weighting factors. So I think, to me, one of the challenges is you go through this work of having a registry, but you're always vulnerable to the, the uh, criticism of, you know, is your, your registry representative of other groups? And I think that's something you always have to be ready to deal with, so. And along those same lines, it's, it's capturing the full sample. And, and for us, we're, we are aiming for a consecutive sample of individuals admitted who meet the inclusion criteria, which are fairly broad. Um, and it, that's always a challenge. I think we, we have targets to get at least 80% of people who are admitted. And we generally meet those targets. But it's very, very difficult. And, and there are certain, certain subgroups that are, are less inclined to be enrolled. And we do require informed consent, which makes us some, uh, perhaps unique from other registries or other types of studies like ours. So that's, that's a problem. And then because we are uh, a, a survey database, we also have issues with attrition. So where we need to be able to follow people up for many, many years. We do pretty good with that too. 80% um, over all of the years is our, is our target, 90% early on, and we meet those. But we've found various ways to meet those challenges and, and actually became specialists in how to follow people because of that. So in the surgical side, uh, you have to keep in, uh, keep in mind that, um, as in, that there is a timeline so that um, what seems so obvious to you this year uh, may not even be the, uh, the relevant uh, issue. So for example, uh, you know, the whole staging for lung cancer changed a few years back. So everything that was in there now has to be looked at in terms of what's the new staging system. And, and a few years ago, as we were, you know, from 98 until 2008, where we did photodynamic therapy for lung cancer, we, uh, it was very easy, right? It was a squame, it was an adeno or it was large cell, that was it. And then we found out that adenocarcinoma has dozens of mutational uh, uh, variations so that it's not just one disease, it's a hundred diseases. And yet we don't have any of that data because we didn't know what the mutational profiling was going to ultimately be. So the limitations in oncology and surgery, um, I think, have to do with not only how many you get in in a short time, but recognizing that the question you're asking may cease to be relevant or you're maybe collecting the wrong data over time. So the timeline is, is an important variable and you should factor that in. Great, okay, if there are no more questions. I just wanna thank our panelists for being out here. It was really thank helpful to hear much. about your experiences. Thank you.